Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. My name is Aaron. I got a chance to meet several folks I hadn't met yet this morning as I was greeting out front. Got some good high fives from some of our kids. That was exciting. But if I didn't get a chance to meet you and greet you, uh, please stop by after the service. I'll be up here in the front. You can come and chat. And before we dive into this really interesting passage of scripture, I have important family business that must be dealt with. This morning, as I always do before service on Sundays, I drove through Tim Hortons to get my sausage, egg, and cheese croissant and my black cold brew, and there was a car in front of me that told the worker, I'm paying for the pastor in the car behind me. (laughs) And I cannot figure out which one of you it was. So I'm going to say it to the camera and all of you, thank you for my sandwich this morning. I appreciate it. I offered then, as is tradition, to pay for the car behind me, which is always a dice roll. Turned out they only had a coffee, so I made out like a bandit. (laughs) Um, It was great. So thank you for that. Uh, It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, Middle schoolers that are here, I'm especially impressed. My son also just got back from middle school camp. If you were one of the volunteers for that, thank you so much. If you're a teenager that got up for the 9 o'clock service after all that, I'm impressed my son is at home in goblin mode. If you don't know what I mean by that, watch the sermon from two weeks ago. (laughs) Today we're finishing up our sermon series that we've been in on the concept of Sabbath. And I've heard back from enough of you with questions, with books that you're recommending, with quotations from other people, that I know that many of us are resonating with this topic. Many of us want to experience more of the peace and the rest of Sabbath. And many of us struggle with finding How do we actually do this? And so today, we're going to look at how Jesus Sabbathed, how he practiced Sabbath, and not in the traditional way of Friday evening to Saturday evening, no work and all of that kind of thing, but he practiced resting in the Lord. He practiced going off by himself to pray, and he did it in the middle of a moment here in Mark chapter 1 where there was so much going on that he could have been doing. Now, I want to caveat what we're going to talk about this morning by saying sometimes we make the mistake of instead of reading the Bible like it's a story about God's action to love and save his people, which is what it is, we can read it like it's a manual on life. And there's nothing wrong with this if you've ever had a diet based on the book of Daniel or something like that. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but that is not why the book of Daniel exists. It's not to sell particularly organic bread to crunchy-minded people. It has a different purpose. And this passage is the same way. However, Jesus is God in flesh. And so it's not wrong for us to go, wait a second, Jesus might know something about being a human being that the rest of us can pay attention to. So I want to do two things this morning. First, I want us to learn from Jesus in his practice of Sabbath. And then second, we're going to see how even God in the flesh practicing Sabbath is part of the story of salvation that we gather to hear, to receive, and to celebrate every Sunday. You with me so far? Give me a thumbs up if you're tracking the agenda of the day. All right, excellent. So did you notice what was happening in the story? You'd have to listen carefully for what Simon says, or you could read ahead. If you look at the passage just ahead of that in the scriptures, in fact, let me tell you the page number. It's on page 813 and 812 in your pew Bible, if you want to grab that out. The passage right before what we heard read, where Jesus is going off to a solitary place, it starts in verse 29. It says that Jesus heals many. In fact, in that passage, it said that the town he was in where he had been teaching in the synagogue and now he was performing miracles, the whole town came and he healed many of them. But what we learn from what Jesus does and what Simon says to him when Simon goes out with the disciples and they find Jesus in the solitary place is that while Jesus had already healed many, there were still so many people waiting outside of the home ready to be healed. Think about this. Jesus is there teaching, and he's healing, and it seems like the ministry is going so well. You know, the the disciples are probably writing down the numbers so that they can celebrate the great growth and the movement of Jesus. All these people have real needs. They're sick, they're hurting, they need a word from God. And what does Jesus do? He goes out by himself into the countryside, and he prays. And he rests. And then the disciples come and they find Jesus. And they say, Jesus, what are you doing? Everyone's looking for you. There's so much to be done. And he says, come on, let's go to a different village and leave them behind. Isn't that kind of stunning? Imagine for a moment what it would have felt like to be the person who had been waiting all night and you finally got to the door. And if the door opens, you're the next one up to be healed. And then someone comes back and says, the teacher has gone on to the next village. Heavy, right? 
We'll get back to that in a moment, but I want you to now learn from what Jesus has done here. I don't imagine any of you will resonate with this, but every once in a while I struggle with people pleasing. Anybody else ever find yourself in the position, only one of us? Uh, what, I, what would please me is that you would raise your hand. So how many people struggle with people pleasing? Yeah. We can have a hard time. If, if there are people who expect something of us, for many of us, I think again, especially in our culture of like, working is better than not working, being helpful is better than not being helpful, being useful is better than not being useful. We have this bent in that direction. In fact, people will sort of humble brag about these things, like, oh, I'm a workaholic, oh, I'm a people pleaser. And it is like a recognition that that's not the best thing, but we're kind of also like, I'm pretty good though, right? Like, I, I'm willing to do what it takes to help the people around me, isn't that awesome? Notice that Jesus is being asked to be a people pleaser, and he says no. He says no. Couple of observations from this. One, this means that if even God needs to sometimes say, that's too much work or that's not the work that's actually my responsibility, then so do we. Heaven forbid that you and I put more on our shoulders than God did, right? Some of us need to hear that, that we are putting more on our shoulders than even God did when he walked the earth. If you believe that your to-do list is defined by everything that everyone in your life, in your workplace, in your family, in your friend group, in your neighborhood, in your school, if you believe that your to-do list is defined by everything that everyone else expects of you, you're going to burn yourself out. And you've put more on your shoulders than God did when he walked this earth. Jesus did not allow himself to be dictated by the demands of the people, even though they were valid demands. These weren't people pretending to be sick. These were real needs. These were real people with real hurts and real hopes to be healed. And still Jesus said, let us go to the next village and preach there and teach there for this is why I came. More on that in a moment. But the other side of this that I wanna observe is what Simon does. The disciples come looking for Jesus and they're like, Jesus, we've been looking for you everywhere and why? What's he say? Look in the text. Everyone's looking for you. Think of how important Simon might have felt in that moment. I'm the most important of the disciples who follow the guy who everyone's looking for. I am like Instagram famous right now, right? Like the, the, the thing about people pleasing is that it oftentimes when we talk about it, when we lament it, when we find ourselves having been in a cycle of people pleasing and we're getting burned out, we can treat it like we're the victim of everyone else's expectations. However, at the heart of people pleasing, so often I think, the scripture doesn't say this outright, but I think you can observe it in this story, is the, the pride that comes when we please other people. When other people need us and need something from us. And so if we get into a cycle of people pleasing, if we start to believe that what we are supposed to do is everything that everyone around us at work, at home, and friends and family expect of us, we're putting more on our shoulders than God did. And I suspect we are getting a sense of our identity, our worth, our value out of how happy we can make the people around us. And if you know any people pleasers, you can get them to do almost anything because of this. Hey, can uh, you come over with your truck and help me move? It's just gonna be you. No. Uh, oh, okay. I, I mean, yes, I'll be there, right? Like that's, we can get people to do unreasonable things if they allow themselves to be so disturbed, so unsettled by our being unhappy that now they must meet our need and expectation. Again, that's not actually them serving us, but serving their own need to be okay. So I just wanna challenge us with that. That if we find ourselves in a people-pleasing cycle, we either are overestimating our abilities and we're trying to do more than God, or perhaps we're unaware of how much our sense of self and identity and value comes from how the people around us feel about us. If that second part resonates with you, I, I wanna refer you back to the sermon from two weeks ago. You can find it on YouTube and go back and listen to that or reread re those passages where we talked about that part of the function of the Sabbath is to remind us where our ultimate source of identity comes from that it is not rooted in what we can do, what we can produce, how much money we can make, or how many people we can please, but rooted in who God has said that we are. And so the Sabbath exposes some of our idols. 
If we find ourselves thinking to ourselves, saying to ourselves, rest sounds awesome. Spending three or four hours doing just recreation and spending time with the Lord sounds wonderful, but I never could. Who would take care of this and this and this and this and this? Well, you're trying to do more probably than God himself did. If you find yourself thinking, if I spent that much time doing nothing productive, if I didn't help other people, I'd feel so guilty afterward. Well, then you probably have some sense of self that is tied too heavily in to how the people around you feel about you. And we invite you to bring those things to the Lord and to practice Sabbath in the coming week or two weeks or month and allow God to do work on our hearts to undermine those prideful ways in which we believe we are more capable than we are or we believe other people's opinions of us are more important than they are. Because Jesus, who was God in the flesh when he walked this earth, did not give in to the temptation and the idol of people-pleasing. Simon comes to Jesus and says to him, we've been looking for you everywhere. There's people waiting, they, they need to be healed, and Jesus says, let us leave and go to this other village. Now, it's not because Jesus is heartless. It's not because Jesus is saying these people don't matter, the people that are still outside the door, you know, they sinned more than the other ones, they don't deserve, it's none of that. Jesus tells us exactly in the text why he does what he does. Look with me in Mark chapter one. Jesus replies to them, Peter says, everyone is looking for you, and Jesus says this, let us go somewhere else to nearby villages so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. This is why I have come. For Jesus, the danger of people pleasing, and it comes up again when Peter tries to tell Jesus, you shouldn't die, we need you, we need you here. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He rebukes people who put the opinions of people or even the seeming needs of people in front of the mission that Jesus has come to achieve. And again, I think there's something powerful for us in this. And that is that a, a way in which we can both work meaningfully and rest refreshingly is to make sure that we are regularly remembering our why. Regularly remembering our why. We are often drawn into doing more than is reasonable for any one of us to do when we start to get caught up in things and responsibilities, tasks, worries, stresses that are beyond the scope of what God has actually called us to do. If God has called us to be fathers and mothers, there is serious responsibility. That's a vocation, that's a calling. And yet it is not our job to keep our children from every conceivable harm. When we find ourselves parenting in such a way that we're wrapping our kids in bubble tape emotionally or physically, we are actually going beyond the measure of what the calling is and taking on all kinds of responsibility that isn't ours in the first place. It happens to us in workplaces all the time, sometimes quite literally. You find yourself buried in a task at work and then stop for a moment and think to yourself, wait a second, I don't remember where this was on my job description. Anybody ever had that experience before? And then you look at your neighbor in the cubicle over who's like twiddling pencils and you're like, pretty sure they're supposed to be doing this and my boss knows they're not going to and so now it's on my plate. You had this experience before? Jesus is saying this. Jesus is saying, I know what my purpose is. My purpose is to come and to preach in each town and each village, to go throughout the area and proclaim the gospel, to invite people into the kingdom of God and heal. And I could get so caught up, fixated on the needs of this one town, this one village that I never accomplished what the Father has sent me to accomplish, but boy am I famous with this 1,000 group of people. Do you see that? Sometimes we spend so much energy and time killing it at things we weren't actually called to do. And again, this is gonna be different for each of us, but I wanna challenge you, encourage you to spend some time listening to God this week, journaling, talking with a friend, revisiting at home, what's my why? What is my ultimate responsibility? Do I have to have the house spotless? Is that actually my calling? Does the yard really have to look better than the neighbor's yard? Is that really my calling? Do I have to polish the truck for a fifth time? Is that real? My truck still has duct tape on it. It's had for four months. The duct tape's like peeling apart. I probably am called to actually fix that now. Um, but like there are things, right, that we start, I hear people sometimes be like, I have so much to do today. I have to do this. And then they start listing off things and I wonder to myself, I'm not sure those are have tos. So do you see how Jesus is giving us a roadmap to where we can also, like him, practice moments of just going and resting and refreshing and being with the Lord? 
If we take on stuff that's not ours to take on, if we forget our why and get caught up in the worries of the world that we have not been called to worry about and work on, we will always feel like we're too busy for Sabbath. If we get caught up in the temptation and the idolatry of people pleasing and we're building our identity on what everyone else around us thinks, they're always gonna put stuff on our plate and we're never gonna feel like we have time to Sabbath. Sabbath won't happen on accident in these ways. So I want to just call out these ways in which Jesus models for us some powerful underpinnings to our identity not being shaped by the people around us, our sense of self not being so grandiose that we think we can handle more than God himself chose to handle, and remembering our why so that we can carefully decide what we are and are not called to give our best and first energy toward. And I want you to notice also what Jesus does with his Sabbath time. It says he went to a solitary place and he prayed. Now this is a puzzling thing, a little bit. We don't have time to really unpack it, but Jesus is God in the flesh. So like, is he talking to himself? Right? There, there's the Trinitarian piece of this, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all communing together. But there's a part in which Jesus is going, he's spending time with the Father, time with the Spirit, and also just time with himself. I think there's something powerful about that, even in our prayer times or our solitary times. So much of modern life is not only full of busyness, but of noise, where it feels like sometimes the Sabbath, this solitude and silence that comes with Sabbathing, is time for our emotions and our experiences to finally catch up with us. To have to sit even sometimes with the uncomfortable feelings that we're using podcasts or TV or busyness to avoid, and then to bring those things to the Lord to cry out to him as we did in that song, Lord, I need you. Here I come, I confess, in you I find my rest. And I wonder if God wants to call us away from people pleasing, away from overloading ourselves, away from forgetting our calling and doing everything under the sun so that we can spend time with him, enjoying him, enjoying all that he created as we've talked about throughout this series, and even catching up on experiencing, sitting with our own experiences, our emotions, our thoughts, our wonders, our hopes, our doubts, and bringing those things before the Lord. But one last observation from the story. Like I said, the story ultimately is not in the Bible to be a handbook for how to practice Sabbath or how to avoid people-pleasing. Those are helpful observations, helpful things Jesus modeled for us, but ultimately what we see in this is the determination of God to bring ultimate salvation. And thank God for that person. Let's go back to that person who'd been waiting all night, standing outside the door. Let's just speculate, and perhaps they had a cough or something going on with their breathing that had been with them for years, and they were so hopeful that finally the teacher would heal them and free them, and they could breathe in deep and breathe out and enjoy fresh air. And they could do activities with their kids or their grandkids that they can't do because they can't breathe in deeply. And in that moment, it would seem to them that the most important thing for them would finally to have this issue with their lungs be addressed. And there could have been a version where Jesus stays put in that village and all he does is heal people. And that person's lungs are healed and Jesus grows old and he dies in that village performing healings. And then that person with the healed lungs still would have grown older, still would have died, and still would have had no hope in the face of the judgment of God. But Jesus knew what his why was. He wasn't distracted or turned away by people pleasing, and because of that, not only did he bring healing everywhere that he went, but he went to the cross and to the grave, and his body was resurrected, and because of that, all of our bodies, all of our souls are able to be healed in Jesus Christ, not just for a short period of time until aging or another sickness comes and destroys that healing which had come before, but once and forever and into eternity as we are invited into the rest that Jesus came to provide. So there are times and seasons even in our lives where it feels to us like, boy, I wish God was working in my life and it seems like he's out having some alone time instead right now. But to look in the scriptures and to realize that even in these moments where Jesus does something that's puzzling, where he chooses to go and to rest and refresh and model for us Sabbathing, when he goes on to the next village to heal other people, leaving some very sick people behind, the whole point, the thrust, the drive, the end result was salvation for every single one of those people that were left back behind at the village. Our God has not come just to heal parts of our body for a temporary amount of time. 
He's not come just to get us through a tough financial season for a temporary amount of time. God in his mercy and love sometimes intervenes in our lives and does these things. But Jesus' why was to come and offer us once and for all and total salvation for our body, mind, and soul into eternity and praise be to God for that. So the invitation to us is to hope in that, to trust into that, to with faith hear and believe that gospel and to live our lives accordingly, to do the meaningful work to which we are called, to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us when we have an idol of pleasing others and invite us back into our why, and to see what fruitfulness God will bring when each of us does even the small bit of the work he has called us to do as he continues to work out his plan of salvation in our lives and in the world and the communities in which he has placed us. So we're just gonna take a moment here at the end of the sermon to sit like Jesus did, to sit with our feelings and our emotions, to sit with the Lord, and to bring before him our concerns, and in particular to bring before him any of our sins, our guilts, our shames from this last week or season. And then to hear that Jesus can, in fact, bring healing and forgiveness to all that we bring before him. Let's take a moment in quiet prayer and reflection, and then we're gonna pray words of confession together on the screen. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would help us, that you would move in us so that we can't outrun our feelings. Where there's guilt and shame, Lord, help us to bring it to you authentically. Where there's fear and doubt, where there's hope and joy, all of it, Lord, we bring before you. And recognizing that the only way that we can bring you our prayers and our praises and our very selves, broken as we are. The only way that's possible with a holy God is because of this work of your son, Jesus. And so together, we pray this prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, hear this assurance of good news in the gospel. Almighty God in his mercy has given Jesus Christ to die for you. And for Jesus' sake, God forgives you all your sin. To those who call in the name of Jesus, he gives power to become children of God and gives you the gift of his Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.